Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden. He drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubim, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. The Conclave Bible, Data Links. Earth 2060. A small group of colonists leaves the ravages of Earth for a distant planet orbiting Alpha Centauri's primary star. Their ship, the United Nations starship Unity, carries them on their journey to a new world and a new hope for humankind. Along the way, a reactor malfunction damages the Unity, precipitating a crisis among the ship's seven most powerful leaders. As they enter the Alpha Centauri system, the crew splits into seven distinct factions, divided not by nationality, but by ideology and their vision for the new world. After the ship breaks apart, the seven leaders guide their chosen crew down to the surface of planet, seeking their destiny beneath an alien sky. Good kitten internet. This isn't the game that you were expecting. And I'll get into why in a bit, because I'm going to have lots to talk about. But this is Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri. Specifically, this is the expansion to Alpha Centauri called Alien Crossfire. But that's just because I don't bother running the base game anymore. Um, Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri is a standalone-ish, obviously it has one expansion, but a standalone-ish game released in 1997 for Windows 95. And it has a very active community, even today. It is considered one of the all-time best 4X games. Um, 4X, for reference, is explore, expand, extend, extinguish. I always mix up one of the 4Xs. Anyway, um, it's a turn-based strategy game along the same style as Civilization, which is not too surprising, given that this has the same creators as Civilization. Um, so, Sid Meier is very well known for Civilization. This was made by Veraxis, which Veraxis is the current creators of the Civilization series. Um, and this was Veraxis' very first game. Sid Meier had been working for Microprose prior to this, before he decided to venture off into greener fields. Greener pastures? I'm mixing up the metaphors again. Anyway, um, point is that this game is basically like a Civilization 2.5 for those that are familiar with the Civilization series. There's a lot of concepts in this game that come from Civilization 2, and there's a lot of concepts that definitely did not come from Civilization 2. You'll actually see some of them in Civ 3, Civ 4, Civ 5, Civ 6, definitely in Beyond Earth, which was a horrible disappointment, and some of which you have not seen in the Civilization game prior to or since. So it's a very interesting game, but most importantly, it is a game that actually has depth. It's the stereotype of a civilization style game is that there is at best an incredibly flimsy story with no characterization whatsoever. This is not the case. There is a story to this game. And there's some very strong characterization, especially of the original seven factions. 
which is interesting because you only get to hear snippets of it from tech quotes throughout the game or from uh, secret project quotes and the like. So this is act not just my favorite turn-based strategy game. This is my favorite game. It's also a game that I'm probably best at. Um, once upon a time, I'd probably be one of the top 10 players in the world for single player, not multi. Uh, and even today, even though it's been a very long time since I have played outside of my little test run to make sure that this recording was going to work, I'm still pretty decent at it, but I've made a few changes. So this is using a pair of mods, and these mods are as lightweight as you get for I'm trying to get the experience of playing Sid Meier's Huff Centauri. I'm not trying to get the experience of playing an overhaul mod. Um, you've seen me play Caster of Magic, potentially. If not, um, hopefully editor me will remember to throw in a link into the description for the playlist. I don't like overhaul mods, usually. And I'm not playing with an overhaul mod in this case. But I am playing with a mod that's going to overhaul parts of the game. Uh, the first part that's overhauled is actually the graphics. So hold on a moment. I need to window this and then expand it back to the correct size again before I forget. Um, this is running in a window, which is not at all something that Alpha Centauri did back when it was released. And in fact, this is running at its own custom resolution. Um, it's 1440 by 1080 at the moment. Alpha Centauri is a 4x3 based game and it starts getting really weird with really widescreen monitors. So I'm just going to be recording Alpha Centauri at 4x3. It's easier that way. I'm not going to mess around with it. Even though it, I'm recording at a higher resolution, so you're still going to see some weird glitches as a result. Anyway, um, so that's the PracX mod. It allows you to, one, run it better in Windows 10 and newer versions of Windows and also Linux. Um, but two, it does things like give you a full screen mode, allow you to specify exact screen resolution, stuff like that. It doesn't actually change in the mechanics of the game. What does change some of the mechanics of the game is the second mod that I'm running, which is Thinkers. What this does is that it alters the game without altering any of the rules of the game to speak of. There are a couple of really minor exceptions to that. But long story short, what it's doing is that it changes the rules of the game enough to give the AIs a fighting chance. Because there's a lot of AI bugs in Alpha Centauri. And it's really easy to exploit them because the AI just doesn't build certain types of units. Or won't do certain types of things because it's not meant to. What the Thinker's mod does is it alters AI behavior where it will actually start taking advantage of everything that it has. On top of patching some very obvious exploits like the fact that you can get an AI to give you every single city that they own if they're happy with you. So those are the two mods that I'm running. So all of the game rules, everything that you are seeing me do will work in if you grabbed a laptop from 1997 and installed Alpha Centauri onto that laptop and installed the expansion Alien Crossfire, which I think came out in 1999. If you installed those onto that laptop, you would be able to replicate everything that I am doing, other than screen resolution and the AI will behave a bit differently. There's no rules changes or anything like that, so this isn't an overhaul mod like what I dislike seeing. Well, seeing's a strong word. What I dislike playing, I should say, because if other people want an overhaul mod, that's great. And I actually do enjoy overhaul mods on a couple of games, but not my classics. Anyway, without further ado, that was my introduction to this game. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, I just had to uh, relaunch the game because I apparently didn't have thinkers running. I just had base self Centauri. Anyway, so um, what we're going to do is we're going to start a new game and I will walk you through the choices that I'm going to make. Uh, please go ahead and ask any questions that you have in the comments. I know the game like the back of my hand, even though outside of my test game, I had not played in, whoo, getting close to a decade now, actually. 
So, uh, first thing I'm doing is that I have an option of either playing with one of the maps of planet, that's the equivalent in the Civilization game of playing on Earth. I don't play on Earth in Civilization games, and I really don't want to play on planet. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to use a random map, and I'm going to customize that random map, because it's fun. So, you have options as to the size of the planet that you want to go with. The smaller the planet, the quicker encounters are going to be with other factions, the more crowded the world is, and also the quicker the game will usually be. The larger the planet, the less crowded things are, which means you're going to have longer delays before you encounter other AI. You're going to not have ridiculously early rush wars. Like, for instance, on a tiny planet, you can actually speedrun the game and win in, I don't know, less than 30 seconds. Um, whereas on a large or a huge planet, you're not going to do anything like that. One thing that the mod adds is a very huge planet. This is not something that is in base Alpha Centauri or Alien Crossfire, but custom sized planets are. And for reference, I have in fact done planets like this. Oh, it's not actually giving you a warning anymore. Um, where is the warning at? Hmm. I guess they just removed the warning. Okay. Um, you really don't want to do that large of a planet. Some of the UI glitches... Or some of the UI glitches when you have that large of a planet, and we're already going to have enough glitches to begin with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a very huge planet. Um, if I remember correctly, huge planet is 128 by 64 tiles, and very huge is 256 by 128. Mm, let me see if I can look that up really fast. So I was right on the size of Huge Planet. I'm actually not sure what very huge planet size actually is. That could be 256 by 128, or it could be 256 by 256. I'm not actually sure. We're going to go with a very huge planet, though, because I like longer games that you don't have to rush in the beginning, because the beginning part of the game is not my favorite part of the game. It's the middle part. And in my mind, the larger the planet, the longer you're in the middle part of the game. All right. The next question is ocean coverage. This is effectively asking, hey, look, how much of the planet is going to be covered with water? In Alien Crossfire, I'm not playing with any of the Alien Crossfire factions in this case, but in Alien Crossfire, there is a faction that starts on water. So if you want to make the game super easy, you give yourself 70, 90% of the surface of planet as water. You start as the pirate faction and you yarhar your way to victory. I'm going to go ahead and do a 50 to 70% and because I'm playing with one of the original factions, which I will be explaining the factions, I am not going to be starting on water, so it's not really an advantage for me. Or a disadvantage, it's equal to everybody. Erosive forces. So just like on Earth, erosion is going to slowly whittle down the super high and tall peaks on planet. What this means in this case is that you're going to have fewer tiles that are rocky terrain. They'll be more rolling, think rolling hills versus mountains. Uh, there'll be more rolling terrain and more flat terrain the stronger the erosive forces are. Conversely, I think it also adjusts height a bit. I tend to go for strong erosive forces. Let's go average this time just because I'm wanting to be a relatively normal game. Native life forms. So if you are familiar with the civilization game, you are familiar with the concept of barbarians. Barbarians are, to explain for people who may not be familiar with it, they are random AI-controlled forces that are not a part of any player. And in this case, I'm counting AIs as players. So, for instance, you might have a roaming cavalry walking around your civilization in Civ that will just attack anything in sight, regardless of who owns it, regardless of whether it's you, whether it's an AI, doesn't matter. And same with the multiplayer game. In Alpha Centauri, you don't have barbarians. Because the planet is capable of using its own defenses. Um, they have their own units. They are very powerful and or very weak. And in general, the more abundant the life forms, the easier the game is. Which is a little weird when you think about it when you're not super familiar with in-depth civilization strategies, but 
even in Civ 5 and Civ 6, that's actually the case, where you go higher up on barbarians and you're actually better in the game because they're a source of money. You take care of a barbarian stronghold, you get money. In this case, you defeat an alien life form, as in you attack it and defeat it, not defending against it, you get money for it. I tend to go with abundant life forms. It also makes certain types of factions easier. Having said that, I am still going to go with abundant life forms, because I did recently read that the game, I don't know if this has been changed with Thinkers, which is one of the reasons why I want to try, because this is my first game with Thinkers, um, that the alien life won't just ignore all AI factions and go after you, like it does in base Mac. So that's why I want to do it. And yes, this is my first game in Thinkers. My test game was actually just using base Alpha Centauri, or base Alien Crossfire rules. Cloud cover. Cloud cover dictates how much rain you get. The higher the cloud cover, the more rain you have on your tiles. I have not explained what rain and the rockiness of tiles do yet, or the height. I will when we get there. But TLDR food. The dense cloud cover means more tiles are going to be arable, and you don't have to do advanced terraforming to make them arable. Conversely, sparse cloud cover means you have lots of deserts. I'm going to go with average in this case. I usually play with dense, but again, I'm trying to make a relatively normal thing. Difficulty level. So, in every Civ style game, you usually have a difficulty level, or difficulty sliders in the case of newer games. What this is, is that there will always, for Civilization and Civilization similar games like Alpha Centauri, the way difficulty is, is that there is a specific difficulty level that is normal difficulty. That is to say, you do not get any extra bonuses, and the AIs do not get any extra bonuses. It's just purely neutral. That's what talent is, in this case. Each... Difficulty level lower than talent gives you some large cheats, effectively, where Citizen will actually just ignore mechanics of the game, even. So if you're playing for the first time, I would actually recommend playing on special Specialist difficulty, unless if there's too many mechanics for you, then go ahead and drop to Citizen. Um, talent is the neutral, and everything above talent will start nerfing you and boosting the AIs. Traditionally, I only play on Transcend. Um, Transcend difficulty gives massive bonuses to the AIs. If I remember right, it drops all of their costs of everything by 40%. Having said that, oh, and I usually um, stomp Transcend AIs into the ground without even think of any, thinking about it. One, it's been a long time since I've played outside of my quick refresher game that I had played before this. And two, it's specifically recommended that you do not play on Transcend level with the Thinker mod until you're used to the Thinker mod. Because the Thinker mod is going to alter enough AI behavior where things don't work quite right. So in this case, I'm actually going to play on Talent. This is probably going to be a curb stomp game. I will probably roll over every single one of the AIs. If I play a second game, I will end up playing on Transcend. But I don't want to play on anything easier than Talent, because one, the game would be way too easy at that point, and two, this still showcases every part of the game. If you were to play on Citizen difficulty, it wouldn't. Alright, now the game rules. Um, so you have the standard rules, and then you can customize the rules. Play with current rules is just play with whatever I used last time. Um, I'm going to go into customize rules so I can show you what I do, because there's a couple of rules changes that I make that are not a part of the default, and there's a good reason why I'm doing that. So, um, the default rules, I believe, are this. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the default rules. So, the first five are just victory types. Um, this is actually the first Civ game with more than two victory types. In traditional, like Civilization 1 and Civilization 2, you have two victory types. You can either conquer the world, or you can blast off into outer space to go to Alpha Centauri, 
hey look, it's this game. This game, on the other hand, adds three additional victory conditions. Really, two, though. Uh, Transcendence is the equivalent of the launch a rocket to Alpha Centauri. That is, you have to go basically at the end of the tech tree and build something really powerful to win. Conquest is the same as any other game. You stomp everybody into the ground, nobody else is around, sweet, you win. Diplomatic victory is something that they actually added in later Civ games as well, which is you get the UN to vote you as the Supreme Leader. It can't be done right at the beginning of the game, but mid-game it can theoretically be done. Cooperative victory is really just a conquest or transcendence or... Uh, it's really one of the other victories, except that you're allied with somebody who did that victory. So, it's basically the same as the others. And, for reference, this is also the same in Civilization 4, 5, and 6. I don't think they did it in 3. Anyway, economic victory is the one that's unique to, to Smack. And it is... I am going to exert my monopoly on all energy on the planet by buying every single city. Yeah. Um, there are economic victories for other games. They don't really have one for Civ in later Civs, unless if Civ 6 has one. I haven't played a huge amount of that. Anyway, um, I'm keeping all of the victories enabled because the AIs are capable of getting these victories as well. And from what I've heard, the Thinker AI will actually be able to do an economic victory, which is unique. Going through the other things, um, Do or Die is in a older style Civ game. So that is Alpha Centauri, Civilization 1, and Civilization 2. For a part of the game, if a faction were to be eliminated, it actually doesn't eliminate that player, so to speak. It causes them to respawn as the other palette swap faction. So, for an example, in Civilization 1, the color white was played by both the Russians and the Romans. So if you had the Romans in the game and you had completely conquered them and wiped them out, if it's early enough in the game, the game will actually restart white as the Russians somewhere else on the planet. They stopped doing this in Civ 3, I think. I don't remember if 3 has the restart or not, and I know 4, 5, and 6 don't. By default, this is enabled, which is to say, if you conquer a player early enough in the game, they will respawn, which I like, because I don't want the AI to just randomly bump off somebody and they're doomed. Having said that, being restarted, you're probably not gonna be doing very well for the entire game, so. Look first. So, in a traditional Civ game, the early ones, Instead of spawning with, okay, here's the thing that you use to build your first city, go ahead and decide where you want it. It is, here's your city. So I usually have look first enabled. It's not going to hurt anything. Uh, well, technically it can. If the AI is really dumb, they can get wiped out at the very start of the game because of this. Because they will move their colony pod around, encounter native life, and immediately die. It's hilarious when that happens. But we have do or die disabled, so we're fine. Tech stagnation. This just slows down the research of the game, so it makes for a longer game. It also gives you a bonus for our bonus score at end of game, if I remember right. I don't like playing with tech stagnation. It's just not fun to me. Spoils of war. Stealing tech when you conquer bases. So... You have other ways in this game of stealing tech, and this doesn't really help me or hurt me, or it doesn't really help me at all. It could hurt me, so I'm going to go ahead and enable it. Um, it's exactly what it says on the tin. You take over a base. If the base owner prior to you had tech that you don't, you can steal it. Blind research. So this is something that I always disable. Uh, blind research is unique to Alpha Centauri, because nobody likes it. Um, instead of saying, I want to research XYZ tech, you go, I want to research an exploration tech. I want to research a build tech. I want to research a conquer tech. And I want to research, let's see, explore, build, conquer, discovery is the last one. 
which means that it will just pick a tech that has one of the one or more of those tags and go for it. So you don't actually get to tell your people, hey, look, I want this tech. It's flavorful because it makes sense. You don't know that you're researching mathematics in a civilization game. Like, they don't know what it is. But, or I should say, conceptually you shouldn't know. In reality, you do. This is a gameplay story segregation type thing where I err on the side of gameplay. I don't want to... I could absolutely, when it's given me the, okay, what's your research goals? I could sit down and figure out exactly what text that I want just by choosing combinations of research goals. I don't want to do that. That's boring. Intense rivalry. Opponents are more aggressive. Smack AIs are already really aggressive. They don't need to be more aggressive. No unity survey. So... What you can do in a game of Smack is that you can have a Unity survey, which is you will actually see the world map. You won't see the details like, um, for instance, there's a city in XYZ location or anything like that. You'll just see the world map terrain-wise at the start. I prefer to not see that. I prefer it not to be visible because I have a randomized world map. I want to explore it. Unity scattering. Um, by default, this is off. Unity scattering is they will have supply pods randomly dispersed throughout the entire map. These are the civilization goodie huts, which is that you enter the pod with a unit and you get a random reward. There are far more supply pods in Smack than there are goodie huts in any civilization game. Far more. Having said that, that's part of the game and the AI has the chance of picking them up as well. And it's on by default. No random events. That's boring. Even though on higher difficulties, all of the random events are going to be negative. Um, fun fact. So in the game Mario Kart, there is something called a blue shell. The blue shell will hit the person in first place. And your chance of finding a blue shell is very much tweaked in Mario Kart based off of what place you are in the race. That is to say, if you're last place, you're going to find blue shells way more often than if you're second. Because the game is, whenever you get an item, it's not actually random, it's weighting things based off of awesome items should be encountered by people who are further in last place. It's a good economic model. Random events in Smack are actually laid out in the same way, it's just it doesn't tell you that. And I didn't know this until <clears throat> relatively recently. So you will have lots of positive random encounter or random events that happen until you're in first place. And then they'll stop being positive. For the most part, there are some negative events that if you have certain things in place become positive for you because you have those things in place. Having said that, and also, the difficulty tweak will make it where you're far more likely to get negative events and positive events. It's still more fun to have events. Accelerated start. This is another thing that I think they stopped in later Civilization games. Accelerated start... Helps if I mouse over it right. Accelerated start is basically... You start with not just, hey, look, I have a colony pod to make one colony, but I have a small civilization. It's for people that don't like the very start of the game, which I'm one of them. At the same time, the AI is horrible at making bases. I don't want them to touch my stuff. Iron Man. Save, restore is restricted to exit. This is, in fact, where Iron Man comes from. Um, I will never play with Iron Man because the game is not stable enough. Having said that, I'm still going to be trying to minimize my save scumming. I do a lot of save scumming because the game gets a little wonky with certain mechanics. I'm not gonna in this case. And randomized personalities and randomized social agendas. I'm not gonna worry about that on this first game. If I do play a second game, or maybe even if I play a third game, I'll go ahead and do that. But we're just going to go with this. And we are going to play one of the seven base original factions. So you actually, in Alien Crossfire, which I can't move that window, um, 
Alien Crossfire adds an additional seven factions. If I decide to play a second one of these, I will be playing an Alien Crossfire game, and I will explain the Alien Crossfire factions at that point. We're going to be playing the base factions. They're also a lot more flavorful. I need more water because I am going to be talking a hell of a lot. One moment. The water. Sparkling water, but still water. All right. So in a game of civilization, you would normally have your choice of what civilization do you want to play? Do you want to play Babylon? Do you want to play Rome? Do you want to play Russia? You get the idea. As was the case in the intro to the game that you saw, assuming the editor of me did this right, because I actually have the intros disabled so I can, you know, not have horribly weird issues. You were explained that instead of it being based off of geographical bounds or nationalism or anything like that, factions in this game are split off of an ideological bent. Which means that unlike a civilization game where you might have, let's say, the early Civ games, there were no differences other than the way the AI behaved and nuclear Gandhi. Uh, in later civilization games, you might have a couple of relatively minor bonuses. Civ 4, I think, had the strongest bonuses where you can actually base your strategy off of those bonuses, but they were... In general, you played Civilization A just like you played Civilization B. That is absolutely not the case in Smack. Each one of these are very different factions, and I want to emphasize just how different they are. One moment. Okay. So, let's go through the seven factions of Alpha Centauri. So, first off, we have the Gaia's Stepdaughters. Uh, the Gaia's Stepdaughters... So you'll notice that there's a quote that comes from each of the factions, and it kind of gives you an insight into what the faction's like. And when you choose the faction, you'll actually hear them, so... In the great commons at Gaia's Landing, we have a tall and particularly beautiful stand of white pine, planted at the time of the first colonies. It represents our promise to the people, and to planet itself, never to repeat the tragedy of Earth. Lady Deirdre Sky, Planet Dreams. So, ooh, actually, I need to go back and increase volume, don't I? Oops, I did not mean to exit. Dang it, one moment. Rat, I can't really get the audio higher for the voices. I'm just going to have to increase the audio in post. Hopefully the background audio won't be too bad, I'm sorry. Anyway, so Gaia's stepdaughters, as was evidenced kind of by the quote, they are tree huggers. Um... Lady Deidre Sky comes from Scotland, uh, in an independent Scotland, actually. One of two games that I know of that specifically feature an independent Scotland. And the voice actor for Lady Deidre Sky is Scottish. Um, you'll actually find that a lot of the voice actors are of the nationality that the character, uh, that the leaders come from. Except for Morgan. I'll get to that in a while. Um... So, Gaia's stepdaughters, as I'm about to hit the info, um, the leader is Lady Deidre Sky, um, comes from Free Scotland, and they are focused on green economics. We'll be able, I'll explain how economics systems work when we actually get to that point in Smack, but long story short, they are focused on being planet huggers who would have thought the planet huggers would have been focused on, or the tree huggers would have been focused on planet hugging. Anyway, they start with a tech known as Centauri Ecology. It is a very low technology, but it's an extremely useful one. It allows you to build farms and so on. Um, you get a bonus to planet. They are the only one of the base factions with a bonus to planet. And believe it or not, that's an extremely powerful thing. Um, they get an even larger bonus to efficiency, which allows them to um, expand faster than, well, not really faster so much as wider than a lot of other factions. However, they have a penalty to morale, which means that their military units are not so great. Uh, penalty to police, which means that they're going to be prone to rioting. And they also get a bonus to food in fungus squares, which will do absolutely nothing for us for a long period of time. So that's basically not useful. And they cannot use free market economics. 
So this this is what I mean by factions are very different from each other because you can't actually choose the same things by playing, say, Lady DJ Sky versus uh, Nwabu Kate Morgan. It's because you literally can't choose free market economics as Lady DJ Sky. Um, so anyway, tree hugging. Then we have the human hive. Let's get the quote. Learn to overcome the crass demands of flesh and bone, for they warp the matrix through which we perceive the world. Extend your awareness outward, beyond the self of body, to embrace the self of group and the self of humanity. The goals of the group and the greater race are transcendent, and to embrace them is to achieve enlightenment. Chairman Shen Jiang, SS on Mind and Matter. So, Chen Jiang uh, is, or Chairman Chen Jiang, I should say, is weird. I'm trying to say things without being able to say certain things without uh, amassing large swarms of bots, but long story short, Chen Ji Young is. Uh, cancel. Uh, is from China. And his concept is. Um, 1984. His theories, which, mind you, this is an insanely intelligent individual. If you read anything with the books or the prelude. Which, yes, I do actually own the books, given that one of them's extremely rare. That's very strange. But um, if you read any of the backstory of the game or anything like that, Yang is by far the most intelligent member of the uh, original Seven, or even the expansion Seven. His concepts are unique. And this is something that you're going to be seeing in a lot of these factions, is that every faction is capable of a great evil and also a great good at the same time. Good and evil are not, are definitely things, but that doesn't mean that you can ascribe one to be, hey, look, this person is 100.0% evil. This person is 100.0% good. Or I should say their actions are 100% evil or 100% good. A person, different story. But, um... Yang, for instance, has no problems with the concept of, oh, you're trying to revolt against me. I am going to have surgery and staple the nerves in the back of your skull and shock you once a day to make sure that you stay in line. That is absolutely something that Yang would do. And for reference, that's called nerve stapling. You'll see references to that and you have the ability to do it yourself. Um... At the same time, a lot of his quotes are dealing with philosophy in trying to defeat pain and so on. His concept is basically, it does not matter what an individual does. It does not matter what you do to an individual. What matters is the growth of society to make a better society for everyone. A rising tide lifts all boats, only this is an evil asshole doing it. So, um... Yeah, so they're, they have a bonus to growth, which means that their population expands faster than normal. Um, growth bonuses are extremely powerful in this pack. They also have a bonus to industry, which is the other super powerful, one of the other two super powerful stats, which means that uh, that plus one bonus to industry reduces the cost of everything by 10%, which is really nice. The downside is their, their economy is utter garbage. Um, they actually have more abilities than what are being shown here, if I remember right, but um, their economy being utter garbage means that they are going to have problems when it comes to getting money or getting research or getting happiness. They also can't use democracy. Democracy gives a bonus to growth. So, mm, I'm not good with Yang. Strangely enough, the AI... This is actually the faction the AI is best at, in my mind, of the original seven. Which is strange. Moving on. 
we have my favorite of the characters, uh, Dr. Proko Zakharov. I think that's how you say it. Uh, let's get the quote. And the substructure of the universe regresses infinitely towards smaller and smaller components. Behind atoms we find electrons, and behind electrons quarks. Each layer unraveled reveals new secrets, but also new mysteries. Academician Prokhor Zakharov, for I have tasted the fruit. So, um, Zakharov is from the Russian Commonwealth which is interesting. This is the first game that I know of that specifically has Russians coming from the Russian Federation rather than the USSR. Obviously, it's the year 2022. You're not going to see people coming from the USSR. But it's just the whole, oh, that was nice when this got released in 1997. Anyway, um, this is your science faction. Uh, but this isn't just science, I like technology. This is science! As in doing crazy experiments on other people. Uh, again, everybody has both good and bad. Nobody is a two-dimensional cardboard cutout figure, even when we get to... Anyway, um... Long story short, his shtick is, I want research. Doesn't matter what else. Like, you want to go experiment on your populace? Be my guest. They're there for a reason. Go experiment on them. It'll be fine. Um, so, let's say, his bonus is in research. He researches things faster. His penalties in probe. <clears throat> Which means I have to explain what the hell probe is. Probe are probe teams. Um, probe teams are Smack's version of espionage. So, it is easier to steal technology from... Zack. It is easier to take his cities with spies. It's easier to cause industrial accidents. It's easier to do everything spy-wise to Zakharov compared to everyone else. But you can also defend against probe teams with another probe team. Which means that his penalty is the weakest penalty in the game. It is basically irrelevant. Um, Zack is one of the two factions that I tend to play. Although I've played as all of them many times at this point. Uh, in addition, he gets a network node at every base. For those that are familiar with Civilization, it's having a free library in every city. That is very powerful because it gives you more research. That, again, that's his whole shtick. He gets research. There's also another reason why this is incredibly powerful. And it has to do with a secret project. I'll explain that when we get there. Um, in addition, he also gets a free random tech at the start of the game. It is random. You don't get to know what it is until you start. Um, he also gets an extra drone for every four citizens. So drones are the civilization, earlier civilization version of unhappy people. Um, which means that every four citizens, he gets an extra unhappy person. This is on top of the fact that after your population grows to a certain amount, everybody's unhappy. What this means is that eventually your entire population will be unhappy. That is his real disadvantage. And it's one that you can mitigate. You can build things that make unhappy people content. Or in this case, you can build things that make drones into regular workers. So yeah. Um, in addition, he can't use fundamentalist politics. He cannot, in fact, become a religious zealot makes sense plot wise you wouldn't want to go fundamentalist as Zack anyway so it's kind of irrelevant next up ah human behavior is economic behavior the particulars may vary but competition for limited resources remains a constant need as well as greed have followed us to the stars and the rewards of wealth still await those wise enough to recognize this deep drumming of our common pulse. CEO Nwabudake Morgan, the Centauri Monopoly. So Morgan is named after and sounds like Morgan Freeman. It's not Morgan Freeman, just sounds that way. Um, Morgan's voice actor is from the US, Baltimore, from what I remembered reading. 
Uh, his voice actor is the only one that's not actually from the region that the character claims to be from, because the character is claiming to be from Namibia. So this is a faction that does not have an analog in other games. Uh, the only one that the closest one that I know of would be the Lumeris in Endless Space 2. This is your money faction. Morgan is all about Tim Bunnies. He wants money. He wants profits. He is your stereotypical corporate CEO. The main difference is that Morgan is a very intelligent person who understands things like, hey, look, if you want your workers to be more efficient, you should make them happier. That's the, again, every faction leader and every faction has both really high positives and really low negatives. So it's not just capitalism ho, it's also capitalism, but why would I want to harm my workers? That means that I'm not getting better productivity out of them. So I'm going to help my workers by giving them healthcare. It's um, patriarchal capitalism, I guess. Anyway, um, you'll notice that Morgan, from just a brief description, seems to be the exact opposite of the guy and stepdaughters. It's not actually the case, but anyway, um, so he's all about to monies. So his big bonus is plus one economy. Plus one economy by itself does next to nothing. It's plus two economy that does huge amounts of things. And again, I'll explain this as we go along, but it also means that he doesn't have to do as much to get to plus two economy. Um, he has a penalty to support. What support is, it's a stat that is for how many resources things cost. Which, I've already explained that there's an industry stat. What I mean is upkeep costs. So, for instance, in a Civilization game, the earlier ones in particular, usually units cost a number of resources as upkeep. In later Civilization games, it's money. In this game, I believe it's just resources, or it might be money and resources, I can't remember which now. I think it's just resources. Anyway, um, with support ratings, you can handle more units for free, and your base will actually start with resources as well. Low support means that you don't have units for free, or don't have as many at least. Eh. Um, commerce. So, Morgan is a very peaceful faction, assuming that you play it correctly, so to speak, because any time that you have a treaty or a pact, you get extra bonuses. You get more money from that treaty than other people do. Uh, same thing with if people ask you for a loan, you get better terms compared to everybody else, which is nice. You also start with some money, and the big downside isn't actually the support penalty. The big downside with Morgan is needing a hab complex for bases to exceed size 4. Normally in Alpha Centauri, in order to have a base go with a population more than seven, you need a building called a HAB complex. In Morgan's case, he needs four exceeding size four. There's also another population limit above that, and Morgan is similarly three lower than normal is when he needs it. So that means that your bases can't be big at the start of the game. Um, that's not great. Uh, to put it mildly, that's a really, really nasty penalty. It's actually the penalty that I have the hardest time dealing with in Smack. Having said that, I have done a fantastic job as Morgan before, so everything is doable. It's just you have to change your strategies. So Morgan is very much encouraged to do um, what's referred to as ICS or Infinite City Sprawl, which is the idea of you just build crap tons of cities everywhere and you don't really care about each of the cities being very good. That is Morgan's whole shtick, basically, of my cities are numerous but tiny. The Spartan Federation. Superior training and superior weaponry have, taken together, a geometric effect on overall military strength. Well-trained, well-equipped troops can stand up to many more times their lesser brethren than linear arithmetic would seem to indicate. Spartan Battle Manual. Hmm. She didn't actually name herself in there. Um, so this is Colonel Corazon Santiago. Um. 
was I going to say? Ah, uh, my brain carded. Um. Anyway, uh, she is a survivalist. And the fun thing is, if I remember right, in in game nobody actually or like in the lore of the game she's not actually the unity security chief she is a random no that's right she's not a random stowaway she was a security chief uh morgan was the stowaway because morgan industries actually paid for the unity project um so santiago is your militaristic faction which is to say that she is encouraged to have a lot of military not to say that she's anti-technology, unlike a lot of other Civ game type things, where usually militarism and technology are the opposites. In this case, her opposite is non-existent. Um, she starts with the tech Doctrine Mobility, which I want to highlight. Doctrine Mobility is the technology that gives you faster units. That's a huge huge thing in my mind because that means that you can scout around faster which means you can get more goodie huts which is a huge bonus and in addition you can actually disengage from battles if you're losing them so that is a really nice advantage and her disadvantage is fairly weak so she gains plus two morale morale is used for combat hey look her units are stronger than normal she gets plus one police Police is used for reducing unhappy population by having military units inside of your cities. And she has a penalty to industry, which means everything costs 10% more. That penalty is nasty, but her bonuses are really nice. Uh, in addition, prototype units do not cost extra min minerals. Um, I'll explain prototyping when we get there, but long story short, the first time that you build something, it usually costs more. For her, it doesn't, which is nice. And she can't use wealth in social engineering. That is a bit of a bummer because that's the main way that you increase your industry rating. So that hurts. Um, let's go to System Miriam Goblins. And by the way, if you couldn't tell, the quotes that are saying out loud are actually also typed right here. So you kind of have subtitles for this. Uh, you'll act everything spoken out loud with one set of things as an exception, you'll actually see written on the screen at the same time. The righteous need not cower before the drumbeat of human progress. Though the song of yesterday fades into the challenge of tomorrow, God still watches and judges us. Evil lurks in the data links as it lurked in the streets of yesteryear. But it was never the streets that were evil. Sister Miriam Godwinson, the blessed struggle. Miriam is a religious zealot. She's not the only religious zealot in the game, strangely enough. Um, there's another one in Alien Crossfire, and toward the end of the game, um, Deidre Sky starts becoming more like a religious zealot. Um, Miriam is an is a faction. Um, <laughs> Miriam, and specifically the Lord's Believers, are infamous for being by far the most aggressive faction in any 4X game. So for those that are familiar with the Civilization series, you'll know that there's a bit of a trend where Moctezuma is usually like a, oh god, not I don't want to start next to him, he's just going to invade me very early on. Yeah, Moctezuma has nothing on Miriam. Miriam is absolutely a, how dare you think about anything but my religion? I am going to kill you now. And it's like, this is the third turn of the game. What the hell are you doing? So, such Miriam Godwinson comes from the Christian states of America. So, in future Earth, according to Smack... The southern part of the United States splits off from the northern part of the United States and becomes the C the uh, Confederate. I mean, uh, the CSA. Yeah, that's totally not meant to be an obvious acronym for the Confederation or Confederate States of America. Um. So yeah. So she has a very interesting background, and 
She is the closest that you will find to somebody saying in this game that she is evil. She's not. So in the opening video that you saw, you had noticed that there were seven pods, actually eight, but one of them exploded. Um, seven pods that came out and they explain in the prologue backstory of this game that each of them basically had their own group of people that they surrounded themselves with and that became the faction. Miriam didn't have that. Miriam was a chaplain for the Unity Project. And instead, she actually went to the damaged part of the ship where the reactor failure had happened. And she found pods, people that were in cryostasis, who were injured. Um, some of them had some brain damage. Some of them had disabilities, injuries, and so on. And she went, these are the people that I can help the most. So they're my people. It was purely altruistic. Which makes it really interesting given how, um... How Miriam she is. Anyway, um, so she starts with social psych. There's a reason why that's important, and that's... Oh, hard to describe. Um, one thing social psych does is it gives you your first building that can reduce unhappy people, and two, it's a prerequisite for an extremely important tech. So even though she has nasty research penalties, she can theoretically be one of the first to get that tech. So speaking of penalties and bonuses, so whenever she attacks enemies, she gets a 25% bonus. That's a hell of a lot, by the way. That's the difference between various types of, like, she doesn't need as strong weapons because of that. Her units can seem weaker on the surface, but if she's attacking somebody, her units will win far more often. Uh, a 25% bonus on attacking is enough to make a 50-50 battle turn into a 90-10, not a 75-25. Anyway, she also gets a bonus to probe teams for some weird reason that I really don't understand. Um, nobody does. We're pretty sure that it was just for balance reasons, and it wasn't a very good balance reason. She gets plus two support, which means that her units are... She can produce a lot of units without having to spend resources for them. She's the other militaristic faction, by the way. Um, she has minus two to research. That is a 20% penalty on technology. That hurts. She also has minus one planet. So this is an interesting thing. A lot of Smack is based off of American politics in the late 1990s. And... One of the things with American politics is that the evangelical right wing of the United States tends to be very much against the environment. That is where part of this comes from. The other part of it is for balance reasons, because if she had a planet bonus or even neutral planet with the expansion, there would be no hope of anybody surviving. And I won't go into much details on that until we start encountering the native life forms. Finally, um, she doesn't get any research until mission year 2110. You start in mission year 2100, so it's the first 10 turns of the game. You get no research. And she can't use the knowledge value in social engineering, which means that the early game way of getting bonus research she can't use. It's not great. But oh boy, is she powerful in combat at the start of the game, especially. Um, you do not want to start next to her. I'm probably going to end up starting next to her. It's inevitable. I always end up starting next to her. Finally, we have Lal. As the Americans learned so painfully in Earth's final century, free flow of information is the only safeguard against tyranny. The once chained people whose leaders at last lose their grip on information flow will soon burst with freedom and vitality. But the free nation gradually constricting its grip on public discourse has begun its rapid slide into despotism. Beware of he who would deny you access to information, for in his heart he dreams himself your master. Commissioner Previn Law, UN Declaration of Rights. It is one of the most important quotes 
from a video game ever. This is the reason why I chose playing Smack, by the way. The current political environment in the United States makes me very, very sad, to put it mildly. And I don't see this ending well. The writers for Smack were very, very good in their research. And a lot of the predictions that they made for the future turned out to be true. LOL is the... Goody Two Shoes of the faction leaders. That's not to say he has negatives. Oh boy, does he have some dark points. But... Lol is basically supposed to be the protagonist of the story. Because Lol is the person that was the second in command on the Unity Project. Oh, I need to get cancel on that. Okay. No, As the changing. Americans nope. learn so painfully. So, Lol was the ship's surgeon. Uh, he was the second in command, and he has no origin of a country. He is not a citizen of any part of the United States. He does come from, uh, if I remember correctly, the Peshwar region of India, slash Pakistan, slash China. All three of them want to claim it. Um, and Lal is Indian in ethnicity. But the point is that he's from the UN. This is a UN-sponsored project. In theory, the UN should have actually been the ones to set up planet. Obviously, that didn't happen. Even the opening FMV, that didn't happen. But that means that he's kind of the leader of the planet in name only. So, Lol is probably one of the best faction leaders for my style of play. He starts with biogenetics, which I don't remember off the top of my head how good of a tech that is. I know it's useful for some things. Um, he only has a penalty on stats. He has minus one efficiency, which means that he is going to start running into problems if he grows too large too fast. Too large width-wise, as in too many cities. But he gets an extra talent for every four citizens. Talents are happy people, which means that he can handle having efficiency penalties, which usually result in more unhappiness. So his bonus kind of cancels out his penalty. In addition, he can exceed HAB complex requirements by two, which means instead of seven population being the cap, it's nine. So his cities are significantly more powerful. And he gets double votes in elections for planetary governor and supreme leader. This is the only faction that you can state of, or really one of two factions that you could look and go, yeah, it's really obvious what type of victory condition Lal does. Um... You can't use police state politics, which is fine, because that's probably the worst one of the options anyway. And yeah, he's all democracy ho. Uh, yeah. So, these are the factions. I need to choose one. Yeah, I think I'm going to end up playing university. It's my traditional one to choose. Also, way back when I first started playing the game, back in 1997... Um, I played the game as the guy's stepdaughters primarily, and I was not good with them. I was terrible at the game when I first started playing. I decided to switch factions, and Zack was the first faction that I was able to play at talent difficulty. And also the first faction that I played at any difficulty higher than talent. So, I'm gonna go with Zack. The uh, do I want to change of anything? The universe regresses infinitely towards smaller and smaller components behind oh, um, fun fact electrons, and behind this definitely electrons, uh, even though it is a text box and, and in theory I can type in whatever I want here new mysteries. it will not actually let you change the gender to be anything but male or female regresses infinitely towards sorry and be friends smaller components. Behind atoms, this game was made in 1997, though. And behind electrons, quarks. Each layer unraveled reveals. I wonder how much of a mod it would take to allow mysteries. for an actual gender thing. I know in game all this is used for is pronouns. So you'd have to add in something to be able to handle they, them, and so on. That would have been nice. Oh well, we're going to play as Zach. 
the substructure of the universe regresses infinitely towards smaller and smaller components. The substructure of the yep. universe See? regresses infinitely towards smaller and smaller oh. components. Anyway. Behind atoms we find Zakharov, a new era of struggle and opportunity awaits you. The UN Starship Unity has arrived in the Alpha Centauri system after a 40-year voyage. All contact with Earth has been lost. That is something to be very... Uh, that's something to note, is that... Planet has zero contact with Earth the entire game. There's nothing. It is pure silence. Captain Garland's assassination by an unknown assailant or after Captain Garland's assassination by an and assailment, the, Q, the crew mutinied. They mutinied against Proven Law, for reference, um, and split into factions. In the ensuing conflict, some seized control of the Unity's colony pods. You now shape the destiny of your university faction, which has just made Planetfall! And that's where we're going to stop, because we're over an hour. Hope you've enjoyed this introduction, Annette, and next time we'll actually get to play. Talk to you next time. Bye!